my, my personal plan is when this happens, I'm just turning the keyboard around, you know. You type, whatever. Okay. Now, the VOs, that doesn't mean that they're as smart as we are, of course. All it means is that they can do as many, you know, computations per second. We have big, massive, repairable brains. But in the end, you know, uh, the software may catch up, and, and maybe they really will be intelligent. I mean, the Silicon Valley is the home. Uh, John McCarthy is here in the Silicon Valley, the home of uh, artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence community, bless their hearts, have been saying for 30 years, we're going to have a thinking machine within 10 years. Okay. And, of course, they're well aware that there's some disconnect here. But, but they will tell you, don't confuse lack of success with lack of progress. There is progress. So I, I have no doubt that it will happen. A lot of people do have doubts. They say, you're never going to build a machine that can teach high school chemistry and deal with the students, too. Right? They, they'll say that. But that's, uh, that's assuming there's something miraculous going on between your ears. Now, I don't know about yours, but I know there's nothing miraculous going on here. Right? If you ask people, could you make an artificial heart? You bet. Could you make an artificial kidney? They got them. Artificial liver? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Artificial pancreas? Don't know, but maybe you could do it. But somehow, when you say, but what about that organ between your ears? Well, that's sacred, man. Can't do that. Right? Uh, Philip Morrison, who was important in the first days of SETI, of course, uh, described the human brain as a slow-speed computer operating in salt water, which I think kind of <laughs> gives you a better perspective. Anyhow, okay, so if you can do this, and the point is, once you do it, maybe you don't do it by 2040 or 2050. Maybe it takes to 2100. So what? doesn't matter. 2200 still doesn't matter. As soon as you've done that, within 30, 40 years, that single machine now is better than all humankind put together. Now, my point here is not to, you know, concern you that you may be the last generation of hominids to run the planet, <laughs> which I know many of you will take as an incentive to adopt a hedonistic lifestyle. I think many of you have already done that. Um, let, let, let me make that point. I, I like this guy. I made this graphic up from a bunch of stuff I found on the web. But I, I, I think that it's sort of instructive again to understand that this is a time scale argument. Right? Here's a horse 60 million years ago right, when they were about the size of a collie dog. Here's a horse today that you can find in, for example, Portola Valley. And it's about the size of a horse. Okay. <laughs> now, that's 60 million years. Okay. Now, on the other side, you have personal computers. I had a personal computer in 1977. And it had a 1 megahertz clock rate, and I think an 8-bit bus. It was 8080. So 8-bit bus. My computer at home now has a 2 gigahertz clock rate, and I think it's a 32-bit bus. So that's, uh, what, what, what is it? That, that's uh, 4,000 times, no, 8,000 times better. 8,000 times faster. So 8,000 times faster in 30 years. On this side, collie dog to horse in 60 million years. You get the point. Darwin is not only unpredictable, but it's really slow. It's slow. It can make some changes quickly if you're a fruit fly. But if you're talking about intelligence, right, our IQs may not really be any different than they were in the Roman Empire, let alone uh, maybe not even in the days of, uh, you know, when we still shared the planet with um, Neanderthals. So that, that's slow. This is fast. So once you develop this in artificial intelligence, assuming you do it, then it, it quickly swamps Darwinian evolution. Okay, so here's the argument. Oh, people say, you know what, that's okay. We're going to put chips in our brains. Of course we're going to do that. I have friends that already have chips in their brains. Here's, and we're going to become like the Borg. We're going to be half human and half machine, right? And we're going to prove on this silly molecule over here. That this, you know, that, that we're sort of a, uh, a going to keep up with the machines because we're going to make, you know, take advantage of machinery ourselves. Well, undoubtedly we will do this. I don't doubt that we'll do this. And this will be very interesting for you personally. But to me, this is like putting a four-cylinder engine, you know, into a greyhound. You, you get a faster dog, but in the end, you say, let's get rid of the four-cylinder engine and just, or rather, get rid of the dog part and just, you know, build the Maserati or whatever. Okay. So although I think that this will happen, it's, it's just transitory and can't possibly keep up with the machines. Okay, so here's the timeline argument. Somebody made this plot. Here's Homo erectus. This, these back-and-forth curves are because they didn't want to draw one long line. But they just sort of some sort of time scale indication how long we spent, you know, sort of ambling through the forest on two legs, uh, eating you know, whatever we found and not leaving a whole lot of great literature. And then, you know, then at some point you get Homo sapiens, whose brain is now three pounds, doing a little bit better. The little dot up there, that's all the time since the invention of the steam engine. The thing is, things happen very fast at the end here. So here's the point. You invent radio so that you go on the air. Within a century, two centuries, maybe three, probably more like two, you invent your successor. So the time in which the aliens spend 
as little soft, squishy gray guys, is very short. And consequently, if we find them, we're much more likely to find than those gray guys, right, are some sort of machinery. I mean, I think you can forget this guy, although I like him because he had the same plastic surgeon as Michael Jackson there on his nose. This, is, this was from the film that I actually enjoyed, uh, The Arrival. It had the bad form to come out, you know, two weeks before Independence Day, so nobody went to see it, but it was actually pretty clever. Anyhow, very anthropomorphic alien. It, it, this is great. Hollywood loves anthropomorphic aliens, but it, it's, I just don't think you should take that terribly seriously. Now, what are the machines going to do? Because maybe it comes down to this. How can we second-guess the machines? Where are they hanging out? What are they doing? How can we find them? Because our SETI experiments might have more luck looking for the long-lived kind of intelligence and not the transitory intelligence that is biological. Well, Ray Kurzweil was at the SETI Institute a couple of months ago, and he said they're all going to you know, build nanobots, and the nanobots are going to you know, swarm through space. Well, there's a problem with that. As far as I can tell, they haven't been, done, haven't been doing that. I mean, maybe they have. Maybe that's why space is so empty. Maybe the nanobots have eaten it all. But, you know, really, this doesn't make sense to me. If you want to, to maximize intelligence, you really want to keep things compact. Otherwise, you have time of flight problems. You know, you, it takes too long for, for information to get back and forth. This also leads to gray goo. Maybe the aliens are turning everything into gray goo somewhere. But this is much more likely that you just have very compact, very compute-intensive entities, right, that are sitting around, and I don't know what they do. I mean, people will ask, so what are these guys interested in? I really haven't any idea. I mean, maybe they're sitting around playing free cell all the time. It's hard to say. Right? You would think that they would have some curiosity about the universe, and you would think that they would ultimately be concerned about the fact that the universe will run down. That's a problem that they will have, too. But that problem is far into the future. Uh, I think it's rather hard to speculate on what their uh, sociology will be, despite the fact that I get <laughs> emails and phone calls every day with people telling me about why the aliens are here abducting their neighbors. This is all alien sociology. And for alien sociology, the data set is sparse. So if it's sparse for the little gray guys, you can imagine it's sparse for things that are completely different than we are. Um, one of the gentlemen in the audience, in fact, pointed out to me, Mark pointed out to me that I ought to read a book by Stanislav Lem, a short story called The Golem 14, in which they invent a thinking machine, which I did, by the way. I did read it thanks to, to Mark. And uh, there, the machine, you know, he, he sort of interacts with the humans for a while and helps them solve some problems here and there. But then he gets really bored with the whole thing, or who, who, who knows what happens, but he just shuts himself off. It's sort of like, you know, you get tired of the goldfish after a while and you walk away. Okay, so maybe that's what happens. But anyhow... If you want to answer this question, you've got to say, is there anything you can say at all? Or is there nothing you can say that's entirely speculative, all of this entirely speculative? There are, if I ask you what's really important in life, right, the young people here will all say sex and money, but in fact, it's really matter and energy, which on earth we turn into sex and money, but it's matter and energy, okay, because they presumably will need both, right, okay, if they want to keep up, <laughs> all right. So let's consider where there's a lot of, Matter and energy. Well, one place I've already mentioned. This is the galactic center seen in infrared. There it is down in there. We've already talked about that. Uh, the other places where you find a lot of matter and energy are where new stars are being born. You get these hot stars like O stars. You know, fewer than 1% of all stars are O stars. But O stars are very much hotter than the sun. They can put out 100 to 50,000 times as much energy as the sun. So if your gusto grabbing free living lifestyle requires a lot of energy... Now you want to hang out near one of these bright stars. Now, mind you, they burn out in 10, 20, 50 million years, but maybe that's good enough to have fun. Okay. Molecular clouds, they have hot stars and lots of material. Okay, here's one, Taurus molecular cloud. Here's another one, the Orion cloud, which you can see tonight, the pair of binoculars if it hasn't clouded over again. And there are, you know, there are lots of material in here. Radio observ uh, observations have shown that. Uh, things that have you know, like a, a few percent or 10% of the mass of the sun in a fairly small, to uh, small amount of volume, and that's a lot of material. You know, that's a hundred times all the mass in the, the solar system. So if that's of interest to you, if you need, if you have build, big building projects and you need a lot of energy, then these are the kind of places you might go, and you might, in fact, be making your presence known. This is, again, speculative. Why would they broadcast? I'm not sure, but one thing that they would want to know is who else is out there. And unlike, you know, biological intelligence, machine intelligence could actually, you know, converse with one another in a sense that they might be able to improve one another. Conceivable.